Good morning. It's okay, we're friends, family, you can talk back. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the 2018 Complete College America Annual Convening. Um, this is an exciting time. Thank you so very much for traveling from near and far uh, to be with us for another exciting couple of days uh, around this larger college completion movement. Um, I'm just gonna jump right into it. You know, everybody is probably across the country who's involved in the student success movement has one central question right now. And that question is, why did CCA choose a conference in Chicago in the dead of winter? And, I, <laughs> and, and I'm going to answer that for you and just say, you know what, things happen. Um, you know, when you checked in, you got some chapstick, so I encourage you to use it. You know, you have those little fancy gloves, you know, so pull those out. Maybe if someone disagrees with your statement, you can slap them in the face with it or whatever makes you feel comfortable. That's what we want you to do. Um, but this is, you know, I think the video really teed up the importance of this movement. Um, our founding president, Stan Jones, uh, who passed last year, he would have been embarrassed to see us talking about him like that because for him, this was never about an individual. It was always about this larger movement. It was about a larger alliance. And it was about the impact that we've continued to make throughout the country. Um, just by a quick show of hands, just so we can kind of get a temperature check of who's in the room. How many of you, this is your first CCA annual convening? OK, a lot of folks. Welcome. Wow. Um, how about folks that have uh, been there for maybe two to five years? OK. Got you. Welcome. Um, and just anybody longer than five years, you're a little more seasoned in this process. OK. All right. I see your hands. All right. Welcome. 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 Um, my son would probably call those individuals um, uh, old school. You know, so we thank you for your service and everything that you continue to do in this work. Um, one of the things that was most important in this movement was the idea that the alliance was forged from individuals who had a passion and a commitment to student success. These individuals came together with one central point and one central idea. It's our problem to solve. And so I think when you, when you think about that, you know, for far too often, um, and I think last year we started talking about our American dreams. For too many students and too many individuals in this work, um, the dreams have actually been more like a fantasy. Because when you're talking about dreams, you're assigning goals and tasks and something that you have to get to. It's not just an idea that we float over and over again. And I think that's the commitment of the individuals that are here in this, in this room today. Uh, in that process, one of the things that we talk about is leadership. What does it take to do this work extremely well? And one of the things that we realize is that, you know, to do this work really well, you have to be introspective. You know, it's not about just judging, you know, outwardly. You have to take a step back and say, who are we as an institution? Who are we as a state? And we've done that even as an organization. This past year, we actually asked um, as many of you, we actually did a kind of a national survey in our strategic planning process to really ask, what is it that we, you know, that you think about when you think about CCA? And there were a few things that came up. These words up here were the most common words that we heard uh, in that survey that we put out nationally. But the most common word that we heard over and over again was impact. And we thought, what better theme for an annual convening? So as we talk about impact, what we realize is that we needed to kind of take stock of the things that have been taking place. You know, I, I, I wanted to kind of look at that definition a little further. And I think about the things that are up here. So the act of coming forcibly in contact with one another. We were accused of that, you know, for our, in our early years, people said CCA was like a bull in a china shop, and, and, and we own that, but it was because we knew that these things had to change, and they had to change quickly. But I really want to focus on the second definition up there, which is having a strong in effect on someone or something. And in that, you know, there are a few things that we wanted to do in taking stock. This past week, if you've been following on social media, 
you know, we kind of released an episodic report that lays out many of the things that you have undertaken um, and some of the things that we've accomplished together. And if you haven't gotten a chance to do that, please make sure you go and check out, you know, completecollege.org, Completion Culture, because I think it's some really great ideas that are out there. We also, over the past years, have released a number of national reports. We've shifted the conversation. You know, time is the enemy, the four-year myth, game changers, a bridge to nowhere. All those things have helped shape our conversation about college completion. And then when I think about Larry's comments that were on the screen a little earlier, um, you know, in 2009, chief academic officers said that, you know, these were the most important aspects of their job. And just a couple of years later, they moved from those ideas to improving retention and degree completion as the number one thing that was important in their role. Even as I think about all the technology solutions that are doing amazing work across the country, we've worked with you to try to nudge them in a direction that we thought would be helpful to your work around student success. And so, you know, this year our Technology Trailblazer Awards will be announced formally a little later on, but these individuals have actually taken up that cause and are starting to incorporate and have been incorporating many of the things that you think will be helpful in your work on campuses. And if you don't get it, if you haven't looked at the schedule yet, each of these organizations are actually doing their own breakout sessions a little later, so we encourage you to kind of find out a little bit more about our Trailblazer Awards. But the most important part of this work has been our alliance. In 2010, there were 19 states that basically took up this charge. As we enter our 10th year, there are 46 members of the Alliance now, representing states, regions, consortia, um, individual institutions, and they're all working to boost graduation rates. Uh, we have a couple new members of our Alliance. We always like to do this. Uh, you know, so our newest members of the Alliance, and if you can kind of raise your hands and we give them a quick round of applause, our newest member is Inland Empire in California. Where are you at? Give them a round of applause, they're over there. and also Northern California. All right, there they go, over there, welcome. You know, together, we've worked towards bold solutions, and the solutions didn't come from us, they came from you. They came from all of you, your ideas. From 15 to finish at Hawaii, to Corec support in Baltimore, and many other things that we're gonna to continue to talk about. Um, being that we're here in Chicago, it's, it's fitting to talk about something that I'm really passionate about, beyond college completion, and that is NBA basketball. <laughs> uh, I love the Bulls. I'm a diehard Lakers fan, but I love the Bulls um, because of the Jordan era and everything. But for those of you who follow basketball, Derrick Rose was supposed to be the second coming of Jordan. He was an exciting player. He came in, he was the, you know, the league MVP, he was the rookie of the year, all that stuff. I'm not gonna run through everything. But um, something happened in his uh, second or third year. He had this horrific injury. And all of that promise just seemed like it was coming down. And, and when I think about that story, that reminds me of the college completion agenda, and in many cases, the work that we've continued to do. You know, that, that idea of changing momentum and realizing that there are fits and starts in this process you know, student success is hard, especially when the targets are moving. You know, so we're required to challenge our thinking. We have to think about the realities of who we're serving. You know, are we making sure that we serve returning adults well? You know, we're thinking about things like, if this is truly a pathway, how do you get students on the pathway? And so we've been kind of evolving and modifying our work and adding new components like purpose first and that career onboarding. And then, we are trying to figure out how do you move from just espousing equity to actually doing equity. And so in Derrick Rose's experience, it was the long game for him. He realized that the long game is not short-sighted. He realized that the difference between those that are successful and those that are not successful is the threshold of pain that you're willing to tolerate. And for those of you who we've talked to all the time, many of you are talking about challenges and frustrations, and in some cases, literal pain that you're dealing with in trying to solve these problems. Some of us quit too early in that process. And that's where this story has a flip side of the coin. After seven years of moving around to different teams after that gruesome injury, but continuing to work hard, 
Derrick Rose a couple weeks ago scored about 50 points for the Minnesota Timberwolves. And when I think of that, I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. When, you know, and, and please, and I encourage you to take a look at that video. That conversation is one that we aspire toward. We want to work through our challenges, work through our issues, but ultimately try to figure out how we get to the end goal, which is more students graduating. There are brilliant people in this room. We know that. Um, but we're not just going to spend time over the next day talking about what we've been learning and just observing the problems. We are more than people that just know things. The alliance, the CCA alliance, is about people that do things. That's what we are truly about. And so as I bring my colleague Bruce to the stage, I want you to realize that we are truly those impatient reformers, those optimists, because we know that our students' lives and our country depends on our success. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn the floor over to my colleague Bruce to talk more about these breakthrough ideas, these game-changing results, and these bold strategies that are gonna to continue to change the future. Bruce. It's always a blast following Danifu Elston. Uh, he really does set the tone. Five years ago, we announced a set of game changer strategies. And the primary objective of this alliance for the last five years has been focused on the implementation and scale of those strategies across our alliance. This past summer, we invited all of you to tell us how you're doing. We surveyed you and asked you to tell us what kind of progress you are making as it relates to the implementation of scale of each of these strategies. And I'm here to say today and to report to you that we've made amazing progress. We're seeing these, these strategies scaled across most of the alliance and many of your institutions and the data is beginning to come in and we're seeing some very positive results. But when we think about this work and we think about our game changer strategies, I think about how we got to this point. And really, every one of these game changers has a story behind them, a story of how they became game changers. And in almost every single case, it was because an individual or a group of individuals at an institution or within a system took a hard look at their data. They saw a fundamental structural problem that was impeding their ability to graduate more students. They came together, identified a solution to address that structural challenge. They implemented that strategy and saw tremendous results. It has been just CCA's job is to elevate the good work that's gone on already among many of you and to then elevate them into what we call our game changer strategies. So what I want to do for you is sort of walk you through the story from inception to where we are today with many of these strategies and demonstrate really the progress we've achieved. 15 to finish. The story of 15 to finish began at a CCA completion academy when uh, the team from Hawaii came together, looked at their data, and saw that too few of their students were on time to graduate in four years at a four-year institution, in two years at a two-year institution. They also saw that they had many students that were enrolled full-time, meaning 12 credits, but were not on time to complete. And they concluded that if we could just see our students boost one more course, take 15 credits a semester, we could potentially dramatically increase our completion rates and also reduce, significantly reduce, reduce our time to degree. So they put their heads together and they came up with a strategy to build a campaign, a media campaign, working with students and parents to communicate the simplicity of why it would be valuable to complete, uh, to, to enroll in 15 credits in a semester. Um, and it was called 15 to Finish. So they got to work. They built the campaign, they shared the video with students, they engaged parents, and lo and behold, they saw dramatic improvements in the enrollment of students in 15 credits, and the dramatic improvement in the percentage of students who completed those 15 credits. And so when we got wind of that, we were excited. We pulled together folks in Denver on a cold March day, and we introduced the 15 to Finish strategy, and then you got to work. Ten years ago, we didn't have very many folks focusing on these types of strategies. But today, 
Almost the entire alliance has some kind of a 15 to finish strategy going on at the state or system level. And we know that within every single member of the alliance, there are institutions that are implementing this strategy. All said and done, you told us that about 455 institutions are implementing 15 to finish today. Yeah, let's hear it. And the bottom line is we're beginning to see some very impressive results. It started with the simple campaign, but now we're seeing media strategies all across the alliance using 15 to finish, think 30, finish in four, and other ways to communicate the importance of enrolling in 15 to credits, 15 credits a semester. And here are some of the results. Nevada, after implementing their 15 to finish strategy, saw the enrollment in 30 credits in a year increase to 74% among their four-year institutions. And of those students, 70% completed those 30 credits. In their two-year institutions, they saw their enrollments in 30 credits increase to 39%, with 67% of the students who did that completing those credits. Hawaii saw that no matter where a student placed in terms of their academic readiness, they were far more successful after they took 15 credits than if they did not. And so they proved that this is a strategy that can work for all students. This past year, we worked closely with several minority-serving institutions and asked them to rapidly increase 15 to finish, or implement 15 to finish on their campuses. And the results were immediate in terms of dramatic improvements in the percentage of students who were enrolling in and then completing 15 credits. credits. So our work is beginning to make a difference on 15 to finish. Math pathways. So our dear friend Uri Treisman at the Dana Center worked really closely with Stan and talked about the importance of students getting through their gateway math course in the first year. And he told a story about so, uh, uh, the vast majority of students that were not in the right math course for their chosen program. Too many students were enrolled in college algebra when we all knew that college algebra was actually to prepare students for calculus. And so many students that weren't in programs of study that required calculus found themselves in this course, creating a roadblock to their success. And he had a very simple vision, that we should design a set of pathways for students that are aligned to their program of study, that will assist them in deciding on a program and ensuring that they can enroll in and complete that gateway math course in that first academic year, facilitating their progress into a post-secondary program, as opposed to impeding it. That was a new idea about 10 years ago. Of course, Texas, with the date work of the Dana Center, had already begun to do this work. But here in 2018, you told us that almost all the members of the Alliance have some kind of work going on as it relates to implementing Math Pathways. So congratulations to you for that work. 502 institutions told us that they're working on Math Pathways. Now, we know this is most, effectively when it's, most effective when it's done at the state level. And the work that we did with the Dana Center uh, and their leadership in creating the model for how to do this by bringing together math faculty leaders together across institutions to look at what's going on in their, in their courses, to identify the critical outcomes that students should achieve, and then aligning them to programs of study, ensuring that students can transfer from one institution to the next, knowing that they don't have to repeat a math course, is going to have tremendous impact for many, many students. Now, this process takes a long time. And so the data comes in slowly, but we're beginning to see some really positive outcomes. Again, Nevada, when they set a policy that said that we want to ensure that all students can access college-level math courses in the first academic year and that every institution had to have a plan to make that happen, they saw an immediate increase in the percentage of students that enrolled in math in the first year and completed that course. And that was critical to Nevada because they knew that students who did not complete their gateway math course in the first year were far less likely to earn a post-secondary credential. So they got to work and they got it done. Co-requisite support. So our dear friend Peter Adams, uh, several years ago, took the time to look at some of the data uh, at his institution. And he saw that too few of the students that were enrolling in his developmental English course ever enrolled in and completed a college-level English course. So he got to work. He pulled together his colleagues around his kitchen table uh, at his home and he developed the ALP model. The ALP model is very simple. Enroll students in the college level course, 
then provide them the academic support they need alongside that course as a co-requisite. He did it, and he saw double, triple the rates of students succeeding in college-level English courses within a single semester. At the same time this was all happening, the Community College Research Center was doing some amazing research identifying what the real root problem of developmental education was. And it was indeed what Peter found, that students could pass a single remedial course, but so often they didn't make it through the whole sequence, and they ultimately never found their way into a math or English course. So the problem of attrition really was at the heart of the matter when we talked about why we could, what we needed to do to solve the problem of developmental education failure. And co-requisite support became the model that we featured, and we put you to work with several states scaling immediately uh, co-requisite support. So we started here in about 2010, and then today we now have a huge number of our states that are working on scaled strategies to implement co-requisite support. So let's hear it for that. All said and done, about 588 institutions you told us are working on co-requisite support. And once again, the data is coming in and it looks remarkable. West Virginia is a 39% increase in the percentage of students who are completing gateway math. 39% point increase in the percentage of students completing gateway math in their first year. Similarly, Montana saw 70% of the students enrolling in their gateway math through a co-requisite were passing it in a single semester. And then the City University of New York, they conducted a random control trial to look at and compare traditional remediation against co-requisite remediation. And they found that students who participated in a co-requisite were more likely to pass that college level math course, significantly more likely to pass that college level math course. They earned more credits, and here's the kicker, they were more likely to graduate. Significantly more likely to graduate. It's fair to say the evidence is in co-requisite works. It is time to get to the point where we're at a, to get to a tipping point and fully scale this strategy across the country. Academic maps and proactive advising. Stan had, a, a, as you saw at the beginning, uh, a real relationship with Larry Abel. They were like minds. Um, Larry, at, the Florida, at Florida State University when he was a provost there, looked at his data and was very unsatisfied with his graduation rates and his on-time graduation rates. And he recognized very quickly that there was not good quality information for students about understanding which courses they should take and when they should take them. And so he got to work working closely with his advisors and with his faculty members to begin design a set of academic maps that gave students a semester by semester plan and how it is that they could, they could uh, get from beginning to the end of a program of study designed to, to complete on time and with the identification of the critical courses they needed to take in order to graduate with a post-secondary credential. On top of that, he engaged in proactive advising strategies to make sure that students stayed on track or if they veered off track, to find a way to get them back on path. That work, that idea was a simple idea that hadn't had much traction 10 years ago, but today we have much of our alliance focused on implementing academic maps and proactive advising on their campuses. Let's hear it for that. All said and done, about 502 institutions now are implementing academic max according to all of you. And of course, once again, the results are beginning to come in. Hawaii, after implementing these strategies, are seeing dramatic increase in the percentage of students who are on track and on time for graduation. Georgia State saw a dramatic decrease in the uh, number of students who were changing their majors in their first couple of years. And then, of course, Florida State. Dramatic increases in on-time completion rate at their institution, at his institution, at Larry's institution, as well as significant increases in the number of degrees conferred, conferred over the last 10 years, with dramatic improvements in the success of students of color, particularly Hispanic students. So there's no question that academic maps and proactive advising are a critical strategy that we should all pursue. And then last year, we introduced a new idea. Tristan Denley, when he was at Tennessee Board of Regents and now at, George, at the University System of Georgia, began to look at his data. And he recognized that if students were able to hit a set of critical benchmarks in their first academic year, they were far more likely to be successful. Students who could complete 30 credits, complete their English and math courses in the first year, enter a program of study and complete some credits in that program, were far more likely to earn a post-secondary credential. 
We were thrilled with this information because we saw immediately that it aligned very well with each of the Game Changer strategies. We had always been looking for that argument to say, uh, to, to persuade all of you to implement all the Game Changers. And now we had that argument that if you could implement what we call a Momentum Pathways framework, aligned approach to all of our Game Changers, you could see immediate impact in terms of momentum through those metrics by doing effective strategies to onboard students into programs of study, ensuring they get through gateway courses, ensuring that they enroll in as many credits as possible, and entering those programs, we can see dramatic results. Now, we're still at the very early stages of this, but we know we have states here that have been working hard to implement many of the game changers already, and we're beginning to see some tremendous impact because of their collective efforts. Indiana has seen dramatic increases in the percentage of students graduating on time at both their two- and four-year institutions, generating far more degrees within the state of Indiana. Hawaii is seeing dramatic improvements in on-time completion because of their collective efforts between 15 to finish academic maps and advising systems. And West Virginia also, based on their work with co-requisite but also building into other pathway strategies are beginning to see dramatic increases in the percentage of students who are earning post-secondary credentials. We rolled out a first set of states that are working on momentum pathways last year, a, a, a set of alliance members that are working on that today. And we're here to announce today that we're adding two more. Colorado and Idaho will be working with us over the course of the next year to implement comprehensive approaches, the momentum pathway framework for all of their students. Let's hear it for Colorado and Idaho. So when we started this work 10 years ago, we had a handful of people that we relied on heavily. In fact, if you were at our earlier meetings, you saw these people over and over and over again on our stage. And it was because they were doing amazing work, trailblazing work. But what's exciting to talk about today is that behind every one of those people, there are now many, many more within each and every one of your Alliance members that are doing the work, that are learning, that are, uh, uh, that are sharing with one another how to implement these strategies and how to implement them at scale. And as we turn the corner at CCA today, we want to talk more about how you are engaging one another. And so when we look at what we've done for this alliance uh, convening, it's much more about you talking to one another, you learning from one another, because together we can see dramatic improvements in student success across this country. But we know there's more to do, and that's what Sarah Ensel is going to talk about right now with us in terms of the future of CCA. There is so much to celebrate in what Bruce just shared. Give yourselves one more round of applause for all that you have accomplished as an alliance. So we should celebrate. We deserve to celebrate. But what we can't do is trick ourselves into believing that we're done. We know that there is definitely more to do. Hashtag more to do. First and foremost, these game changers work. And there are 500 or so institutions working on them across the country. But we have not yet achieved the level of scale that we can. So until we are at a place where all 46 Alliance members have implemented all of these strategies in all of their institutions, all of their programs, all of their students, we're going to have more to do. If we can get to that level of scale, we ran some numbers, and it was astonishing to me that we could generate over a million more degrees across our country. A million more Americans with a degree or credential of value that are ready to take that next step in their career, in their life. That's work that we need to do. CCA has never been about change at the margin. We're always about big numbers. This is a big number. So we really need to go all in on the game changers and get to full scale across the country. I'd like to think of this as a, a minimum. So we can generate at least a million more degrees because I have confidence that as we've been doing this work, we've been learning from those experiences, we've been learning from one another, and we're getting better at it. We're getting smarter about it, and we're finding out new things as we go through this journey together. Case in point, the idea of what it means to be college ready. There is a core component 
of college readiness that has very little to do with math, very little to do with English, and everything to do with purpose. So we know from research that Tristan Denley and others in the field have done that students who have a sense of purpose are much more likely to be successful college students and persist to graduation. At your place, you'll see a publication um, that CCA has put out in partnership with several other organizations around some shared principles of purpose. Um, and we know from all of our Alliance members that are working on a full moment and pathway strategy, they are infusing the idea of purpose and integrating that into the moment and pathways framework. So we need to go all in on the game changers. We need to do so thinking about the idea of student purpose. But we do still have some hard truths that we have to face. There has been a rising tide, but it has not lifted all boats. So the gap in college completion between Hispanic students and white students has stayed the same. The gap between older students and younger students is widening. The gap between African-American students and white students, in many cases, is also widening. So we clearly have more to do on this front. Much of CCA's emerging work and the newer things that we're doing in partnership with you is laser-focused on addressing these gaps. So last year at this convening, we released a new game changer, a better deal for returning adults. In this afternoon's plenary, we're going to do a deep dive into this strategy, and we're going to look at the evidence base behind it. We've also been learning from a lot of our partner organizations in the field that are also deeply committed to issues of equity. The Education Trust, for example, has identified three different things that all need to happen simultaneously if we're going to close our achievement gaps across this country. And I'll draw your attention to the third, because this relates to the game changers very closely. So we know that institutions where black students are more likely to attend must improve the rates at which black students complete. Our partners at Excellencia have found that the same thing is true for Hispanic students. The good news is, we have game changers. We have strategies that improve college completion rates, and if we can deploy those much more rapidly and much more intentionally at the institutions that are serving our students of color, we can tackle these achievement gaps. On the Stan Jones stage later today, you'll have an opportunity to learn about the work we're doing with minority-serving institutions to scale the game changers and to do so in a way that honors the culture and the context of those institutions. In just a few moments, you're going to hear about our emerging metro strategy. So we know that our, our nation's cities are where the bulk of our diversity is and where the bulk of our poverty is. So we're working very intentionally in these metro areas to scale game changers, but also to galvanize community supports to improve student success. Just moments ago, our CCA fellows kicked off some work that they're going to be doing over the next year. Um, to think even more intentionally, get crisper, get more specific about things we can do to address issues of equity and returning adults. So I've talked a lot about implementation efforts, but I want to bring the conversation back to the policy level. CCA has always believed that smart policy is crucial to advancing our mission. So policy at the institution level, at the state level, at the federal level, can all work for us to remove barriers to implementation, to catalyze change where it needs to be catalyzed by policy, and also to reinforce the good work that you're doing and make sure that it's sustained over time. Stan was a legislator. Stan sat in probably hundreds of hours of budget hearings. Um, and CCA's first big policy play in our earlier years was around performance-based funding. So Stan knew that our state legislatures are investing in higher education. In the past, they had been investing in access. And Stan wanted to shift the conversation to investing in success and completion. So along with many partner organizations in the field, outcomes-based funding became more the rule than the exception. And through our appropriations process, we are now leveraging the money to ensure that institutions are in an environment in which student success is crucial to their success. The good news is, things continue to evolve in higher education, and there is a new type of investment that is growing rapidly across the country, and that's the investment that 
localities that states and potentially even the federal government are investing through promise programs and free college for all. But we're at a fork in the road there. So we can invest those dollars as we did years ago with our appropriations in the goal of getting students into college, or we can do so with an eye toward ensuring that we are investing in their success. If you missed the session on the Stan Jones stage yesterday about promise with a purpose, I would encourage you to go to our web platform and view our most recent publication around how these programs can really be designed and aligned to a completion and equity agenda and how important that is for our success as a country, particularly with all this new investment. We need to make sure it's leveraged correctly. So this has been a time of reflection for us at CCA. As we've been going through a leadership transition, as we've been looking back, we're thinking about entering our 10th year, we've been thinking about from our founding until today, what we've accomplished in partnership with you, what we've accomplished as an alliance. And I think it's really, really exciting work. But I know that the field is going to evolve in the future in the same way that it's evolved over the last 10 years. I don't know what that's going to look like, but our commitment to you from Complete College America is that we will remain on the cutting edge of whatever that is, and we will continue to find smarter and better and more effective ways to support you in meeting your completion and equity goals. So with that eye to the future, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome up onto stage the newest member of the Complete College America family, a woman who is deeply committed to student success um, and who is well equipped to lead this organization into the future, and that's our new president, Dr. Yolanda Watson-Spiva. Good morning. Well, I would have played I'm Every Student, but that song hasn't come out yet, so um, thank you very much. You've heard a lot from my colleagues about the game changers and our scaling efforts over the past, uh, nearly, uh, what, since 2000. And over the course of the last decade, this alliance has shifted the conversation in higher education and attempted to shape a new vision for dramatically increasing college completion rates in this country. We've wrestled with the data, identified solutions, and joined the, in the effort to scale strategies that benefit the students the most. And while our tactics continue to evolve, our vision for the future is pretty grounded in a mission that is devoted to creating opportunity for all students, regardless of their skin color, the zip code in which they were born into, or their station in life, or any other barriers that have been laid before them. CCA has been long committed to taking action and to pursuing scaled implementation of the Game Changers, as you've heard about today. And that is work that I'm excited to continue advocating for. But as a new leader of CCA, I'm also aware that a good question is just as important as a good answer. A year ago, we presented a new vision for implementing our Game Changers as a comprehensive student success strategy called Momentum Pathways. We'd like to know, are Momentum Pathways resonating with you and your colleagues? So that's a question we'll talk to you about throughout the rest of the convening. We also articulated the need to address persistent attainment gaps. What have we learned in the past year that will help us to eliminate these gaps entirely? We also launched Purpose First, and you've heard a lot about that over the last couple of days and today, highlighting the need for students to have a clear objective for their education, and we also laid out a better deal for returning adults. But what do we need to do to see if these strategies will take hold on your campus? Have they taken hold? Do these strategies resonate with you and the campuses upon which you serve? And what are the other tools and resources that you need to be successful? How can we better empower or support your work? How can we help to support and advocate for policies in your state that will make a difference and eliminate barriers for student completion? Our mission is clear at CCA. And as we celebrate the success of the Alliance and the Game Changers, we still have to have deeper conversations on where there are gaps in serving our most marginalized and underrepresented populations. Equity will look different in each of your states and each of your campuses across the Alliance. So we may talk rural versus urban, we may talk male versus female, we may even delve into socioeconomic status. But we will not forget that among all of the many demographics and the demographic categories, Unfortunately, race still continues to be a constant underpinning in inequitable structures. Our alliance has grown and we've gotten stronger, 
There are old friends who have been instrumental in shaping our collective work, and there are newer faces. We saw the show of hands in the room who will be critically important as we move forward together. But as we enter this next phase of work and move toward the outcomes we all aspire to achieve, the CCA team will increasingly rely on each of you to challenge one another, share what you've learned, provide new ideas for where we go next, and to commit yourself to the hard work necessary to ensure that many more students earn college credentials. So our challenge to you is to get everything that you can out of this convening, to get everything you can from one another, the cross-pollination of information and strategies and best practices is critical to the success of this convening. Get everything you can out of the sessions. But don't forget that also CCA is your partner year-round. So this is not a one-and-done sort of interaction for those of you who are new. This is really the beginning of a continuum that we will continue to march with you on for the rest of 2019 and into the future. You'll make plans at this convening, and we will be there to support you in executing those throughout 2019 and beyond. So let's launch into the coming year focused on what matters most, ensuring every student we encounter is given the opportunity to pursue their dreams, find their purpose, and learn, and earn, sorry, the credential that gets them there. Eliminating college completion equity gaps is central to that work. We look forward to partnering with you in this effort, and as an inpatient reformer, we won't rest until every low-income, underrepresented, first-generation student possesses a credential or a degree of value and is living out all of the benefits of achieving the American dream. Thank you so much for your time and look forward to working with you over the next couple of days.